I am Ezer Kim. I'm moderating the session. We have two amazing presenters today. Um, we will hear from the two presenters first. Each will present for about 15 to 20 minutes. And after we hear to both presentations, then I invite um, the whole group for a conversation. You can leave your questions in the chat in the meanwhile. And when the time comes, you can raise your hand and um, I'll call upon you. Uh, welcome to the session called Economics and Pedagogies of Social Justice. So our two presenters first, we have Reverend Dr. Hee-Sung Hwang. Um, she's an assistant professor of Christian religious education at St. Paul School of Theology in Leewood, Kansas in the United States. She is an ordained deacon in the United Methodist Church. Her research interests include multicultural religious education, Religious Education for Social Transformation, Eco-Theology, and Eco-Pedagogy. Um, her paper title today is Unraveling the Intersections of Capitalism, Consumer Culture, and Climate Change, Pedagogies for Social Justice in Religious Communities. Um, and our second presenter will be Shannon Hopkins. She is a Christian social entrepreneur. She has launched nearly 20 social impact projects, ranging from a church plant called the Soul Cafe to an anti-trafficking campaign, The Truth Isn't Sexy, um, to social enterprises working with women that were homeless. She's currently the co-founder of Rooted Good, working with churches across the U.S. to launch social enterprise and transform the assets for community impact. And she lives in London, where she is... Um, explore the rural context as the seedbed for innovation. And she is a recipient awards, including the Lockheed Innovative Leader Award and the Woman of the UN and UK Woman of Peace Award. And she's also received this year's REA Warnham grant. And her paper title is Notes on the Land, Board and Economics of Mutuality Formed by and Informing New Communities. So um, I am excited to hear both of the presentations. But first, um, Hee Song, the floor is yours. All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. What a great way to say <laughs> all of this thing together. So greetings to you all from the good evening area of the world. <laughs> all right, let me share my screen first. All right. Thank you for your interest and participation in this session. And I I live in and work. I live and teach in the United States, but I'm currently in South Korea visiting my families. Uh, summers in South. We just talked about briefly before this you know, <laughs> this session starts. Uh, uh, summers in South Korea are typically, of course, hot and humid. And for as long as I remember growing up, uh, it could easily reach 28 degrees Celsius, 82-ish degree Fahrenheit. Uh, but this summer, 28 degree feels pretty good. Oh, well, it used to be that if it reached, th reached 30 degrees, it was considered extremely hot and, and would make the news. However, this year we've been experiencing, whoop, we've been experiencing uh, I don't know, uh, the temperatures ranging from 30 to 35 degrees. And they are calling this summer the hottest in the last 75 years. Hmm. So the other day I talked to with my uh, my friends about climate change and joked that we might even experience 40 degree days in our lifetime. I mean, I can I still cannot believe that we were making such joke. And I also uh, realized that sadly, we are not the only ones playing this kind of joke. And also sadly, I also know that these conversations are not just a joke, but an irreversible reality that we cannot just laugh about, right? This challenge has been mounting for decades and we no, no longer speak of it as a looming crisis, but as a current reality that may have reached an irreversible point. And according to a report by the World Meteorological Organization, 2023 was the warmest year on record, with global average surface temperatures rising almost 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial baseline, marking the hottest decade ever recorded. Of course, soon WMO will need to change the record and ranks with the 2024 data. 
In this age of escalating environmental crisis and deepening uh, social inequalities, the intersection of capitalism, consumer culture, and climate justice presents profound challenges that demand urgent attention. As writer and activist Azar Barber, whoop, okay, let me move to Azar Barber, um, rightly points out, our climate emergency is everyone's problem, and many of us from wealthier nations have sadly impacted others who haven't contributed in the same way to what will happen to our planet. The ideologies of capitalism and neoliberalism, which prioritize success-driven individualism and unrestricted consumption, are major contributors to environmental degradation and climate change. And I believe that religious communities have the potential and responsibility to challenge and change these systems. And however, there hasn't been enough exploration of the specific teaching methods for religious communities in addressing environmental issues. So this research intends to fill this gap and contribute insights to inform transformative social change. So I will focus on exploring how religious communities engage with the complex dynamics of neoliberal economics, excessive consumption, and the imperative for climate justice. And by investigating the theological frameworks and educational approaches within these communities, my goal is to uncover strategies that not only foster critical reflections on consumer culture's environmental impacts, but also advocate for social justice and sustainable living. And I aim to identify and support the, the development of innovative approaches to ensure that the voices of religious communities are heard and their contributions are valued. In that, in that way, I'm really excited about this session that not only for my presentation and you know after, after this, the Shannon's workshop uh, presentation will also uh, sh uh, shares a lot of insights. That's what I'm really excited about it. So for my session, main, uh, the main research questions uh, guiding my study are how do religious communities conceptualize and respond to the challenges posed by contemporary local and global consumer culture and their impact on climate change? Um, and second, what theological frameworks and pedagogical approaches can faith communities employ to engage their members in critical reflections on consumer culture and its implications for environmental sustainability? And third, in what ways are religious communities collaborating with climate justice movement and how do uh, their pedagogies contribute to broader social change? In his book, The Day the World Stopped Shopping, J.B. McKinnon explores a thought experiment on the impact of a significant reduction in global consumption. He argues that reduced consumption would lead to a decrease in environmental degradation, lower carbon emissions, and less waste production. And this would result in cleaner air, healthier ecosystems, and a slowdown in climate change. McKinnon reveals that there is a business concept called the four mores that could stand as the motto of modern consumer capitalism. Because it sounds greedy and underhanded, however, it's rarely mentioned outside business schools. And the four mores are as follows. Sell more things to more people more often for more money. Such processes inevitably produce more carbon footprints and more destructive environmental consequences. Many people are obsessed with the idea, idea that consumption is the only way for the economy to work and for society to move toward the progress and success. The structure of production, the obsession with success, whatever that is, and the desire to enjoy greater wealth consume the environment and other creatures to keep this great will of production and consum consumption rolling, and ultimately at the expenses of people, both local and global. And McKinnon points out the, uh, the result of such actions and consequences by saying, it isn't only that consumption is distorting the climate, failing the forest, clutter cluttering our lives, filling our heads with a throwaway mindset, even stealing the stars from the night sky. 
The worst is that it leaves us with no idea of what else to do, no belief that things can be different. Whichever we way, whichever way we go, it leaves us doomed and cold. So to such an end, if religion does not provide frameworks that can encounter the capitalist society of infinite consumption and competition, then who will? If religious organizations, faith communities, don't offer an alternative way of life, a direction for a movement, then who will? I think that's a neglect of duty not to act. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that we need to create a new theological understanding here. Rather, we need to rediscover and recover what we used to value. As a theological framework for responding to such issues, we should pay attention to these following keywords, divine call for stewardship, moral responsibility, communal spirituality and social salvation, and the practice of kinoting, self-emptying life. In his book, uh, Climate Church, Climate World, Jim Antle shares a compelling call to action for religious communities to take a leading role in addressing climate change. Antle frames climate change as the greatest moral challenge of our time and argues that faith communities have both a moral obligation and a unique capacity to combat the environmental crisis. He highlights the ethical responsibility to future generations, arguing that today's actions will have profound implications for the planet's future inhabitants and that faith communities must act now to ensure a livable world for their children and grandchildren. So first, we need to remember that our covenant with God is an everlasting covenant. And God does not uh, care only for us. God, co God covenants with all future generations and with ev every living creature. Second, we must take seriously that we are called to love our neighbors as ourselves from the wisdom of the good Samaritans and the golden rule. We must recognize that future generations are no less our neighbors than those who live next door to us today. Therefore, we must recognize that the earth is the Lord's and we are stewards who hold the earth in trust for future generations. Then about uh, moral responsibility. Human beings' moral responsibility stems from recognizing the human activities, particularly the burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, and un unsus unsustainable, unsustainable agricultural practices are the primary drivers of global warming and environmental degradation. As stewards of the earth, individuals and societies have an ethical duty to mitigate the impacts of climate change by adopting sustainable practices and policies. Therefore, a collective and conscientious effort to live more sustainably is imperative to ensure the health and well-being of both current and future gener generations. And many scholars point out that Christianity's failure to pay proper attention to and respond to environmental issue is that uh, is due to its focus on only personal spirituality and personal salvation. Eco theologian Mac Sally McVeigh emphasizes that spirituality should include a relationship with God's creation as well as the discipline of care. This spirituality is not personal. It is communal, based on mutual learning and mutual care. And Jimmy Antle stresses that the importance of community in addressing climate change. He believes that faith communities, communities can provide the support, inspiration, and collective power to drive significant environmental pro pro progress. And uh, McFaig, in her book, Blessed Are the Consumers, Climate Change and the Practice of a Restraint, she argues for a kinetic, self-emptying theology that emphasizes uh, restraint and simplicity as a form of modern discipleship. McVeigh suggests that individuals should practice self-emptying by consuming less and living more sustainably, not only as a moral imperative, but as a means to protect the planet and promote social justice. And she writes, we must refuse the cycle of consumption, replacing more with enough. Such a move requires the acceptance of limits and a sense of proportion that acknowledges the interconnectedness of all life. 
So by promoting a kinetic lifestyle, McVeigh calls for a radical rethinking of how we live, consume, and relate to the world. This shift, she argues, um, uh, this shift is essential for addressing the root causes of climate change and fostering a more equitable and sustainable future. Then what we need to remember from the exploration of theological and ethical frameworks is that we cannot save ourselves individually. We can only fully comprehend the divine providence by being part of the whole picture and of God's creation care. Jennifer Ires, in her book, Inhabitants, Ecological Religious Education, emphasizes that religious education has a crucial role in fostering an ecological consciousness and a commitment to caring for the, uh, for the earth. Her work highlights several key pedagogical strategies, such as ecological literacy, spiritual practices, community engagement, intergenerational learning, and storytelling and narratives. Well, actually, I was going to you know go through each of these points, but you know, Iris covered many of these important points in her presentation yesterday. So I'm not gonna go repeat it. You know, <laughs> I recommend you to revisit her paper and the presentation recording. So let me move on. McVeigh uh, then suggested three dimensions to practicing a kinetic living: personal professional and public levels. Personally, it involves living simply and with a restraint, significantly reducing our material comfort so others can have their fair share, which includes in considerations like the use of cars, size of homes, and commuting methods. Professionally, it means continuing our work in our trained fields, but adopting ecological practices within them. And publicly, it requires using our influence and resources to support environmentally um, and environmentally conscious politicians, educate ourselves and others on ecological issues, and implement principles of fair resource use and environmental stewardship. And she said, Volunteer poverty for us is not serving soup, but using our distinctive access to contribute to a planning that is uh, that is sustainable and where scarce resources are justly distributed. Here, our main role is to contribute whatever access, talents, gifts, money, influence, and so on that we accumulate during our brief sojourn here on Earth to improve the world, ensuring others have what they need. This reflects our interconnectedness and shared responsibility for stewardship of creation in the vision of the repurposed church. Jim Antel, in his book, uh, envisions the concept of a repurposed church that plays a pivotal role in addressing the climate crisis. Antel suggests that uh, the church must redefine its mission and activities to become a driving force for climate action and environmental stewardship. So here as, uh, as a, um, two examples of how this vision fits uh, into a theological and educational framework, I examine the eco ministries of Trinity UCC in Chicago and Church of the Resurrection in the greater Kansas City. I have chosen these two churches because they are located in the areas where I have lived or currently live. And this allows me to receive local news and the testimonials firsthand. And additionally, they have good online access to church events and resources. So that enabled me to do the digital ethnography in some way. So first, the Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago has a strong commitment to addressing climate change and promoting uh, environmental justice. Trinity has a dedicated green, uh, green team ministry which integrated eco-friendly practices into church operations in and engages the congregations in sustainability efforts. And their initiatives include, you know, in the following categories, their initiatives include offering educational programs and workshops on environmental issues and sustainable practices, and implementing energy efficiency technologies, waste, reduction strategies, and sustainable landscaping on church pop properties. 
and partnering with local organizations to support environmental justice initiatives in the community is also a big thing for them. And engaging in advocacy, whatever advocacy efforts to promote policies that address climate change and environmental injustice. And they also in incorporate environmental themes into worship services, sermons, and prayers to raise awareness and inspire action. And all Earth Core, or the Keepers of the Resurrection, is an environmental ministry initiative at the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection in the greater Kansas City. And their activities also include hosting classes, seminars, and workshops on topics such as climate change, conservations, and sustainable living. And as you as you see, uh, as you just you know can see the the screenshot, they create some uh, great uh, video clips to share with the wider community. And they also implemented a rec recycling programs and energy efficiency system and the community wide and establishing community gardens to promote local food production is also in their plan. Uh, and also youth engagement is one of their uh, specialty and involving young people in environmental project and education to instill a lifelong commitment to ecological stewardship is their ongoing educational effort. And of course, weaving environmental themes into their worship services, prayers, and other uh, educational materials to highlight the spiritual and ethical dimensions of caring for the earth is the work that the Earth Core is doing. While these churches have strong infrastructures, I am aware that there are many other churches quietly practicing self-emptying uh, echo spirituality in smaller communities with their own vision and purpose. For this, for this uh, research itself, I had a limited time and limited access to the you know, more you know, established uh, churches and their digital resources and so on. But I want to also recognize that, that there are many healthy churches will be out there <laughs> uh, practicing such you know, self-emptying echo spirituality in that way. And I'm looking forward to delving deeper into their lives and ministries as part of my next research project. In conclusion, religious communities have the potential to play a transformative role in addressing the environmental crisis by exploring and adopting theological and pedagogical frameworks that emphasize the divine stewardship, moral responsibility, and communal spirituality and kinetic lifestyle. These communities can contribute to the creation of sustainable and just societies. And by doing so, I really hope, I hope I really pray that we can create a world where every individual and community can thrive in harmony with the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this amazing presentation. Um, now we would, I'm excited to hear from Shannon. Um, I think this is her first REA experience. So why don't we give her a warm welcome? Take it away, please. Oh, thank you, Esther, and thank you, Hussong. It was um, really good to hear your presentation, and I will say um, I have a whole reading list now, um, just noting down all your books, so thank you. I wonder, not many people have been using the chat, so I just wonder if you'll take a moment to either say something that in the chat that really stuck with you out of Hussong's talk, and also if you just say where you're from. I'd love to know where in the world people are zooming in from. Um, but I will get started. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, these aren't, um, let's see. Okay. Um, so let's see, I'm going to move myself out of the way. Um, so I'm Shannon Hopkins and I'm a social entrepreneur. I'm not an academic. Um, I've really just been a practitioner for the last 25 years, working at the intersection of faith and social innovation. And almost all of my time has been spent in the urban context. Um, so I've been based in London for the last 20 years. Um, so really urban. I'm like 
on the Thames River. I'm like a 20 minute walk from the Tower of London. I've just been smack dab in Tower Hamlets. But back in about 2018, um, I started getting really curious about the rural context. I started looking at what was happening when creatives were moving out of the city. Um, and most of that move was because they were being forced out because it was getting too expensive to live in the city. But as these creatives started moving out of New York and San Francisco, London, Manchester, Berlin, and moved into rural context, it wasn't just because of the cost of living, I started to see that it quickly um, started shaping new ways of life. And that just had me really curious. What did it mean for the future of communities, how communi spiritual communities would form? Um, and so, you know, that was just bubbling along in the background for me before 2020. And then in 2020, in the midst of lockdown, but even before lockdown started, I had chosen to take a Sabbath year and to begin a process of discerning if I was done in the UK and if it was time for me to move back to the US. Um, and during that time of discernment, I started looking again at the future of the land, the rural land, and asking questions about the future economic of the land and its potential for innovation, and specifically innovations for spiritual communities. Um, so out of that kind of questioning, um, I produced this booklet called Notes on the Land, which if at the end you would like a digital copy, I'm happy to share it. Um, I produced it as a handmade kind of love letter to the UK. Um, and it's out of this presentation I'm going to present today. So the title for this talk is Notes on the Land Towards an Economics of Mutuality Formed by and Informing New Communities. So let me just set the context a little bit and specifically the UK context. And some of this is true everywhere and but anyway, but but I'm specifically looking at the UK. So I think in the UK today, we stand on the precipice of an undeniable crisis that looms over the, the future of rural land and land use here. It's a crisis that affects everyone, regardless of location, whether you're urban or rural, age and so socioeconomic status. What's going to happen in the next 10 years is we're going to see the biggest transfer of wealth in history. And that's going to include the biggest transfer of land that the UK has ever seen. In the midst of this, we also are reeling still from the impact of Brexit and will be for generation for a generation. Um, and Brexit has brought in significant changes for landowners. It's impacted subsidies that farmers and landowners have been dependent on. That includes things like the basic payment scheme that ended in 2023, which is what was keeping most farms afloat. And with the challenges of Brexit, in addition to climate change, inequality, rising food prices, um, environmental degradation, what's happened is the interest but and the need for regenerative land management has become critical. So, um, I think that's exciting. I think it means that now we don't just have interest, but we know things have to change and that opens up all new possibilities. So what I found as I began my exploration is there were so many people wrestling with questions around what's the future of land use look like in the UK, what's needed going forward for the health of the land and for people and the planet, and what innovations can drive more sustain a more sustainable land economy in the UK? So as I started looking around and walking the land, I just came to this place where I really believe that this is the moment that needs our attention, our ingenuity and our collective wisdom to forge innovative solutions for the land and community. 
And we have this historical opportunity to do something, to think about what kind of world we want. And it's at this intersection that innovation holds new promise, that we can change, the future can be better. And there are people and communities that are already coming up with alternatives. And so I think that's the other really exciting thing about this moment, that we're not starting from scratch. There are hundreds and hundreds of people across the UK, farmers, social entrepreneurs, impact investors, smallholders, woodworkers, worm farmers, beekeepers, and developers that are really working to find innovative solutions. But regenerative economics is at the is the driver. And I again, I think that's one thing that I found over and over as I started meeting people is it wasn't just about climate change. It wasn't just about what can we do in this place, but it's really what does is there a place for regenerative economics in this conversation? So again, the questions that started driving me is what's the future economic of the land? And if we lean into the economics of the land, will it lead us to new forms of spiritual community? Um, so then just a little background, it's just a beautiful image of some UK countryside with some illustration over the top. But what I found is um, that what's going on in the background is like our rural um, areas are particularly vulnerable and there are lots of people talking about how even the beauty of the countryside now is at risk and that's a big deal here. Um, we're living with the impact of really poor short-sighted decisions that were made for our woodlands um, about 50 to 60 years ago. So now in the UK only about 7% of our woodlands are in good condition um, and that like impacts jobs, it impacts our heating costs, it impacts, um, you know, our housing. It, I mean, it's just really multi-layered, which, and I have to confess, I'd never really thought about the woodlands before doing this work. Um, then I mentioned earlier, like our subsidies have totally gone away. Um, in terms of farms, over 50% of family farms have gone away in the last 55 years in the UK. Our soil is damaged and eroding. Human health is being impacted um, because the land is degraded, our food production is reduced, um, energy costs are rising. So, and all of that's impacting health. Obviously we know that um, we have really extreme weather events. People in the UK will both celebrate that that now means we can grow really great wine. Um, so our white wines are beating um, the French Champagne region wines, but we're also having massive flooding. And so, you know, it's really mixed and really bad weather. Um, and then we have insufficient food production. So that's just like what's going on in the background. It's um, And then for me, just to kind of go away, my timeline, I started just... Um, really looking at the land in 2020 after um, a long time of working um, in social innovation work in the city and really kind of going, is the city still kind of the hotbed for innovation? And so, um, oh, actually, I'm going to show you some photos. So I mentioned that we, and I don't have these in um, my slideshow, so forgive me, but I'm going to show you just some photos from the web. I mentioned that we're not starting from scratch and we aren't. Can you, if someone can nod that you see this photo of a lake and yeah, okay. Um, I just wanna tell the story of like three different people that I met. So first of all, there's a farmer outside of Stevenage, which is near Cambridge. Um, Tim Waygood is his name. And I think that is the best surname in the world to have, Waygood. Um, but this is his land and he has church farm Ardley, but Tim was a generational tenant farmer. And I actually, he was the first person that I heard talk and literally I heard him talk about 10 years ago about an agrarian renaissance, that this is a time for an agrarian renaissance that will um, combat the impact of the industrial revolution. 
And at the time I thought, I just think, I don't know that we're going to see that in our lifetime, but now I think we're, we're beginning to. Anyway, Tim has this big piece of land. He was a generational tenant farmer. He went to agricultural college and when he, um, he went to college, he said, well, if I farm like this, I'll be broke. Like my father and grandfather were broke. So he let the land go fallow. And then about seven years ago, he got ill and he looked out the window one day and said, the way that we farm is making us sick as a people and as a nation. And he set out to prove that on five acres, you could be sustainable, profitable, and feed a village. So now um, he he just set out, he took five acres. He's not a person of faith, but he actually started reading the Bible and looking at what can I learn and how would this inform how I farm? And he does mixed use farming. And I just encourage you to go to his site. They do everything. They do care farming. Um, they run schools events. They now do glamping. They've taken over the whole farm now. They're incredibly profitable. He gives his time away to any small holders um, to, um, that want to learn how to be profitable on their, their small holding. They have a farm shop. They've taken over the local pub, has become a farm-to-table pub. Um, Anyway, it's just super exciting. Um, so that's Church Farm Ardley. And he has young people. He has a list of thousands of young people that want to come and work on his land every year. So he is an official woofing site now. Um, and they do have a rhythm of life on the farm together. Um, and then this is Orlington House. It looks really grand, <laughs> this photo. And it is grand in some ways, but... The, there's a family that moved in to create a center for rest that if people want to come and have rest, you can go and stay there. And it's an intergenerational family. So it's a couple with their mother-in-law who is aging in place and their father-in-law died shortly after they moved there. And then a son and a daughter-in-law and then the next generation will be born in coming months um and then they're growing food and they're doing neighborhood events on there and there's um multiple people using their space to meet in and they have just moved they took a year of listening when they first moved onto the site to say what is it that we're called to do in this place and then this is a photo of um two families at pickwall manor um, which is not a huge plot of land, but it's a manor house. And this these two families moved down and they decided to live and hold everything in common. Um, and they share their finances. They live very simply. They run this business, Pickwell Manor, and another business they ran in London that they ended up selling. And when they sold it, they put 99% of the resources into a foundation and it supports all of their work with refugees and climate justice but they have been real advocates for how do we live differently in the places where we're called um so i'm going to go back so those are just some stories i could tell loads of stories of um worm farmers and um even regenerative builders um i'm just going to pull my slides back up um Sorry about that. That was clunky. Um, but I think I tell the story of landowners, and those are really exciting ones, but every landowner I met, um, it's a struggle um, because most of them are stewarding these assets at a time when everything's changing in terms of subsidies for the land and new regulation around development. So, um, and, and just going back to my own process, when I started discerning if I was gonna stay or if I was gonna go back to the States, I had to ask the question, is there anything that I can do on the land in the UK as an American? So over again, over half the land is owned 
by a very small percentage of the population, like less than 5%. Um, and, and land here, rural land is really expensive and it's highly regulated. Um, but what happened for me is that in 2020, the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, I started getting calls from people who had inherited land or chosen to buy land at auction or even some youth workers that were given some land by the nuns. And they all just asked me to come and walk their land and pray with them for a new imagination of what could be done here. So even like the Orlington house folks, they they knew they didn't know what to do. So it was just walk the land and wait. Um, so as I started walking the land and meeting with the landowners, I realized I couldn't just talk to them. I had to really think about the whole system. And that took me, like I had to go and understand what was happening with the subsidies what was happening with developers? Where was philanthropic money going to help with the land? Um, that we really, in this moment, have to think like a system and then act like an entrepreneur. So that any hope that we have of making an impact in social and environmental innovation is intrinsically connected to the health and vitality of a wider network or whether, rather a wider ecosystem. And so, and I think that's been probably one of the things I've doubled down on is this is ecosystem building, that whatever happens on the land is landowners are gonna have to move into a mixed economy. They have to think about it as ecosystem building. Um, so, um, so, as I started looking at the different parts of the system, I then started to understand and try to identify what are the specific barriers for new landowners. And I focused on new landowners because one, that's who I was meeting and who was inviting me onto their land. They also were at the beginning of asking the questions. Um, and so, um, so that's where I focused. I think these are true even for landowners that have had their land for a while, but this is this was who I knew. So I think there are five five barriers for landowners. One is isolation. Two is they have weak networks that's connected to being isolated, but it's different. It's complexity, the complexity um, of the work is a barrier. There's a huge skills and knowledge gap. And most new landowners have a very short runway. So landowners are isolated. There's limited access to information, resources, and support, and it's chaotic. It's not that there's not information out there, it's that it's confusing and they don't know how to access the right information. They also don't know other like-minded landowners. So most people have come into the land and, and it's not, they're not already connected. What's happening with the isolation though, is it reinforces a mindset of scarcity. Then you have these weak networks generally across the system. So um, there are sparse networks as a whole and that kind of keeps people from collaborating. So it also, there's like a lack of interdisciplinary interaction. Never before have I done work that needs so much intervention from so many different disciplines. And like, we just need a cross-pollination of ideas in this moment. So with weak links and sparse networks, the potential for transformation remains completely untapped. The third barrier, the, the complexity. So the Kniffin framework talks about the difference between simple, complex, complicated, and chaotic problems. This is, I mean, I think it's, it's not really chaotic, but it is uber complex um, to use a not academic term, uber complex, but it, you know, this interplay between ecological 
sustainability and economic viability with social equity involves navigating such a diverse stakeholder interest group and dealing with historic and systemic challenges that have to adopt regenerative practices. It, it's just challenging. So, and then there's a skills and knowledge gap. I haven't met one landowner um, that, that I was walking the land with that had had any experience farming. None. So you've got even the people that had chosen to buy land at auction or the youth workers that were given the land from the nuns, like none of them had had any experience with land or land management. So there's just a huge skills and knowledge gap. The great thing is they know what they don't know. And when you know what you don't know, you're more open to collaborating. And then finally, the fifth barrier is a short runway. So most of the landowners I was talking to, they had massive assets. So I have one landowner that literally people were knocking on their door, offering them tens of millions to sell, but they didn't have money to pay their heating bill. And But they felt this immense pressure of stewarding. And if they just sold to private developers, they knew the land would be gone. But the short runway creates pressure. Um, and the financial constraint just hinders their capacity to explore um, community-focused solutions. So all of this um, gives us like we know it's time for change, but it gives us this immense opportunity for change. And walking on the land one day, I realized I just had this drawing about this interplay between the connection to the land. Like if we're really connected to the places that we are and we lean into community that um, not just the people that will live on the land, but the people in the communities around the land, then um, it, this moment there's this interplay with creativity like this moment demands creativity but these the people and the place will also it creates this hotbed so i don't know if i'm explaining that quite right but i i think it is this interplay um for a connection to place community and creativity that's gonna um give us the way forward so there's tons and tons of hope on the horizon but we, I think how we build, um, we have to have some guiding principles. So all of my work, I say, um, I have kind of three overarching kind of practices that I'm, it's all about connecting. So connecting people and ideas that it's about being catalytic. How do you start things that can actually create a new kind of energy? And then it has to be create creative. Like we've got to actually create something. But then these kind of other um, kind of values that should drive whatever building or development work we do is it needs to be holistic. Um, it has to have alignment. I love this permaculture principle that the fringes are fertile. Um, and I think that's why I love being in conversation with all these new landowners is because they are so on the fringe, but out of that, it's very fertile. Um, and then we need to have a perspective for the common good. And I said a minute ago that the financial constraint hinders a community focused solution. But what I've found is that if you can help landowners think about the common good and that then actually, again, like there's more creative solutions start to rise to the top. Um, as I began to think about, well, what, what next or what would I say about this space? I realized that there are a few very specific opportunity and innovation spaces. Again, if we're thinking about this as a systems change opportunity, one is we need to work to build new and more dense networks. Um, we really need to work on narrative change. I mean, there have been a lot of writing. I used the word crisis at the beginning, but um, I think we need to use more hopeful language too and show the good stuff that's happening and shine a light on that. 
Um, we need to really encourage rural entrepreneurship. There are so many young adults and and entrepreneurs that want to do things on the land, but they don't have access to the land. So it's ripe for partnership, but how do we really encourage rural entrepreneurship? And then development. I think here we're facing massive housing needs, but also um, there's loads and loads of impact investment money. So if you can bridge um, some investment capital for eco housing in partnership with landowners, it will also bring people onto the land in new ways, as well as bringing some resources for more regenerative agricultural practices. Um, so I just had, if I were going to do something, I had these kind of five very practical, like sparky ideas. Um, one is I think the woodlands is low hanging fruit. Like people really want to 2020 put a spotlight on woodlands in a new way, but could you host a woodland dinner with impact investors, owners of woodlands, artists, the amount of artists that aren't working with British wood, like how do you just even help them to think about that? Um, I do cohorts for rural entrepreneurship. How do we do a storytelling gathering to get more good stories being told? Um, it's interesting now, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Wilding, because I think you need to tell the story one farm at a time, but that is a story a movie, it's um, kind of a blockbuster style movie of the Kanep estate called Wilding. So that has actually been done since I wrote this. And then a funding tool. I think a lot of landowners don't know how to think about the different shapes of capital that can help them do development. And we need that knowledge to get shared in more practical ways. Anyway, so that's just some of what I've been thinking about, I'm more convinced than ever that um, if we pay attention to the economics of the land, it's got the opportunity to lead us to an economics of mutuality and that actually it it's where we're going to start living differently. I can think of three farms that just this year, they're starting to model that. It's very early days and I don't think it's worth like sharing their story yet, but like the sprouts are there. Um, and I do think if we lean into the land, specifically young people are going to show us different ways to do spiritual community um, today. So thank you for letting me share with you. And yeah, I'm just looking forward to being in conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your amazing presentation. Um, I really loved like all the stories you told us and yeah. Um, so I invite everyone to the floor now. You can ask questions if you want to um, follow up with anything. Um, feel free to just have a conversation with uh, the speakers and with the group. I want to ask a question of her song. Is that okay? Sure. Is that okay. Um, so early on, her song. I can't remember. Um, you made a comment that if religious communities don't offer an alternative way of life, who will? Um, and it made me think about in the UK. I hadn't thought about this in a long time, but over twenty years ago, there was fair trade fortnight. The religious communities were challenging consumption and fair trade practices. And it was very organized. Um, and I wonder why we're not seeing a bit more of that. And or are we and but it was very specific. It was the church, but it it caught on in the mainstream very powerfully. So I'm just curious if you've thought about that at all or have any thoughts about that. Oh wow. Thank you so much for the question. And I don't know the why. <laughs> I don't know the why part, but interestingly, in one of the books I mentioned earlier, uh, McKinnon's When the World Stops Shopping, he specifically mm. brings an example from the England. And mm. he also mentioned that at some point, England has a very you know, active and dynamic 
religious communities and their activities and so on for the, uh, not only for the religious people, but also for the wider communities, but somehow that that dropped. And mm. he then, then from that conversation, he uh, brings to bring us, bring the leaders to the next conversation about revisiting the concept of Sabbath. Mm. So yes, that's something that, you know, as I mentioned, that we, we don't need to create a whole new thing. We cannot create, <laughs> but yeah. we, what we need to do is we need to rediscover the old, uh, the old wisdoms and the things that we valued before. Right. Mm. So there was, somehow I also thought that it's very ironic that we need to rediscover and we need to repractice what we mm. use to do, what we should do. Right. Mm. Just like taking a Sabbath. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so mm. it's interesting because I mentioned one of the I showed the photo of the house where they created a place of rest. And it was interesting that the couple that did that, they realized they first had to let the land rest. Like we they've been thinking about how we ourselves rest in Sabbath, but how do we start with letting the land rest as well? Anyway. Yeah, it should be our, you know, daily and weekly practices, but somehow at this moment in the modern, you know, busy, busy, busy world, it became mm. a radical idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mary, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in to say that I think some of what's happening, at least in the U.S., uh, I'm shifting, excuse me, to think about things like um, basic income, universal mm -hmm. basic income, the ways and what we call solidarity economics. So churches that are starting to organize co-ops and other kinds of ways to um, impact the economic system within the framework of capitalism. I mean, I, it, obviously lots of issues with capitalism, but I don't think it's going to go away in the next decade. So what do we do within it? And mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of experimentation. Like we have here in St. Paul, Minnesota, I think three different basic income pilots going and that's happening all across the country and um, religious organizations are collaborating in that way. Um, so I was really excited by your notion of regenerative economics. I think it fits also with solidarity economics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. It's amazing to hear people practicing um, universal basic income in the States because here it felt like the conversation was ahead, but there's been no practice. It feels like there's no practice. Um, but I think, you know, and I'm not an economist, um, but I do think, you know, one of the things that I'm starting to see with one landowner is, and this is where I think it's some about mutuality. Like, so I have some young people have moved onto this land. They can't afford to get on the housing ladder but they're letting them build houses, tiny houses that can be moved away in exchange for some work kind of putting in um, vegetable gardens. And then they're equally sharing the vegetables between themselves and the food bank. And so I think, and then it's super interesting. It's also bringing new value to the land. Anyway, so our Joyce is um, popping up. I can see her. Um, I also see a question from Nick on the chat. Yeah. It says, great presentations, a combo question. The year of listening, what does this entail? What are the discernment skills necessary for this? And how can we help teach these in our churches and communities? Um, um, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. You go, you go. This song, you go. Um, uh, okay. It, it, uh, this question just remind me of the book uh, of Jim Antle's book, Climate Church and Climate World. And he also mentioned he's been a you know, climate uh, activist for a very long time while being a UCC minister. And he mentioned that there are so many churches, so many people who, does, who don't want to hear about this, who don't want to hear about the crisis. So they need comfort, mm -hmm. <laughs> spiritual comfort in the church. So it's uh, it's been always a challenge for him to kind of pursue, uh, uh, his goal, uh, to to address these issues in the in the church communities. And he mentioned that he you know, strongly suggests to, um, uh, change your sermon first. You know, as um as the you know uh to being a repur as I mentioned about the repurpose the church. 
uh, so you know, change your sermon for the climate, uh, more oriented, climate issue oriented, uh, sermon issues will be the first step. So I really highly recommend that reading, as it also kind of you know highlights and some you know offer some guidelines by uh, uh, following the you know some some specific themes and the the, the seasonal offerings. So I will start from there. And for the discernment skills, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, we need to be courageous hmm. sometimes, you know, to, to pursue it. So sometimes to speak out, we need to prophetic voice. Hmm. We need to have it. Yeah. I, I love that. I think you're right. The, we have to be courageous because everything in the world says do more, go faster. And discernment is about stopping, slowing down, waiting. Um, and so I do think, I do think it takes courage. Um, I also say, I think the best thing, it's probably been the best thing that's formed my practice since I moved to the UK is walking so I say, even if you're in a, you know, even if all you can do is walk around your church or around your house, like just start walking and walk regularly and start seeing what you notice. Um, but even that will slow you down. And I think I do have one landowner that took the year and that's what they do every day. They just walked different parts of their land um, and just began to notice Um and it and that just helped them pay attention. Um, and then I think your thing about changing your sermon first is right. This is not really about the land, but about 10 years ago, we had a pastor in Leicester call us because 20 people in his congregation wanted to start social enterprises. And they called us, and we just were like, uh, really? <laughs> like. So we just were like, what makes 20 people that want to start businesses go talk to their pastor? Um, but it turned out he'd been preaching for a year about vocation. And so I think you're right. I think changing our sermon, changing the sermon works. Speaking of sermon, um, Dory shared a link. Do you want to elaborate more? I would love to, not on the link so much, but on some of Shannon's U.S. work and just connecting to what she just said about walking the lands. I have three brief points. I got to visit Shannon in the U.K. last year, and we visited um, Tamsin's farm. So Tamsin is one of these people that Shannon knows who's inherited or, you know, this large piece of property <clears throat> just outside of London has fallen into her lap. And walking the land with her there were a group of three or four of us, but just walking the land with our imagination and creativity switch turned on, like, oh, this could happen here, and this could happen here, and Tamsin knows that she could sell this land for a big chunk of money and keep her family and her progeny um, flying around the world or owning a yacht for many years. But what are the alternatives and what does it look like to engage across generations imagining we could have what we need here, but we could make we could develop this in such a way that it sustains uh, the village, <laughs> the literal village surrounding us for progeny, you know, so that's one thing just like what does that look like in other places, what does that look like in America to walk the land that we have access to, I mean it's very connected to Heber's story yesterday about the black church food security network. So that was one thing I was thinking about and then the other thing I just want you all to know and I'll put the link in the um, chat in a minute, is that this is connected to Shannon's US work and Shannon I'd like for you to say just a bit about the book and um, the 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 church property in the U.S. that is changing hands, and how does this connect around uh, some of the things that Hisung has brought up? The book uh, Gone for Good. So, if you could mention that, I think it's connected to Hisung's paper. Yes, um, thanks, Story, and and then Emily, I saw your question, and I'll answer that as well. So, yeah, in the U.S., um, I'm the co-founder of Rooted Good, and we are working with churches. Um, to think about their assets in their community. So my co-founder, Mark Elston, edited a book called Gone for Good. We brought 19 practitioners um, 
to kind of co-author that book. And, you know, they're saying 100,000 churches will close by 2030. That will have the greatest reshaping of American society since the GI Bill. There has not been another kind of reshaping of communities um, with religious land since then. And so, and that is just tons of land. And to put that into perspective, in um, Baltimore, there's um, the church, the Catholic church just sold two thirds of their properties. The Methodists have like somewhere around 50 properties that are going to have to have new economic models. A big chunk of those could be sold or redeveloped. But out of that, we're seeing, you know, churches and cities tear up parking lots to become gardens and farms. We're seeing churches transition their property for economic development zones. It's also for housing. And it's been really, I spent a year um, kind of twisting myself in knots. How does this rural work in the UK connect with this big work in the US? But I've realized the it's the same challenge. It's um, the future is a mixed economy. The future is going to demand if we lean into the new economy, we'll do spiritual community in new ways. And um, and it, it just doesn't matter. The UK church just missed it. And so the innovation is happening on the land. I think the US has a really interesting opportunity. So... Um, and then just to say, Emily, um, yeah, the, the rural research, um, the way I'm seeing it impact um, urban settings, I mean, we do have a lot of people can't move onto the land here, so, but they'll go and do things, like there's a group out of St. Ethelberger's Church called Lifelines, where they take urban churches onto rural land to build hedgerows together, and then people come back and start thinking, well, what can I grow if even if I only have a little balcony or if I can get my neighbors and my rooftop to grow fruit and veg together. So, you know, I think it's just, there's experimentation happening in the urban. I just focus mostly on the rural here. Um, I just wanna uh, offer a brief answer to Israel's question on the chat about theological primary work and consideration of engaging virtue ethics and so on, and the nurturing of the theological and cardinal virtues. And for my work at itself, you know, I didn't particularly engage with these parts. I really wanted to kind of, you know, for the you know, short presentation and my short paper, <laughs> short research, I wanted to pay more attention to theological and pedagogical framework development. And I know that, you know, Jim Antle's work and Sally McVeigh pay, uh, pays, pay more attention to this, uh, to other parts of ethics and theological uh, virtues and, and so on. So, yeah, may, thank you for your question and suggestion, you know, for my longer and future project, I will consider more. Thank you. Oh, I've never heard of The Last Child in the Woods. That's a great, it's another great recommendation. It's kind of like ridiculously nostalgic slash a boomer looking back on how great his life was, but there's like a lot of good stuff in there also. Mm. Cool. Well, thanks, Emily. Thank you so much for all those great resources, Sherry. This is great. <laughs> hmm. And I kind of flew through and did not answer the question about eco preacher, but maybe Wanda can say more about that, the eco preacher mm -hmm. grant and um, cohort, Wanda. You're muted. I stepped away for a couple of minutes. I was looking for that book that I just posted in the chat. I couldn't find it otherwise. So what, where was the question? Oh, Eco Preacher? I, yeah, yeah, I mentioned it and then someone asked to know more about it. And I was just mentioning that it came up in one of our sessions earlier this week. 
Well, I would encourage folks to come to the nine o'clock session where we will hear more about that. Um, that's one project through the BTS Center that I have not been um, involved with, but um, essentially it's been a cohort of preaching support, helping uh, preachers learn more about how to um, effectively engage their congregations um, in um, action toward climate justice through preaching. But um, that's one of the items on the agenda at nine. So I would encourage folks to come to the nine o'clock plenary. Since we're talking about economics here, I would love to um, know whether either of you are seeing models emerge for what comes after late, late capitalism. And are any of the things you're writing about, does it feel like the church is being creative and um, giving us examples, living into what does it look like after capitalism? Hey, Song, do you want to go first and then I'll go? I will just say that I didn't, I didn't find a really good example for that. I've been looking for it, though. You know, for as I mentioned about uh, you know the importance of kinetic uh kinetic lifestyle, I really wanted to find a good church or community of uh, uh for that model. But you know that that's still my uh uh the next research subject. You know how can you find it? How can you measure? <laughs> mm -hmm. How can you measure for it? So I'm looking forward to hear from Shannon. Do you have a good answer? I, you know, I think it's the same. I, I'm not sure that I can say definitively. I think this is what post post ca late late capitalism into something new is going to look like. I think we can see signs of this economics mutuality where people are giving up power and giving up money to the other and sharing. I the one group that I'm watching is a group called Stir to Action. They're really a consultancy here in the UK, but they're working with landowners to give up their land for community ownership. And um and I and I and they're having some success. And um and then I know that there's um there's a landowner that's giving up some land in the north of the country and they're giving it to a group of um, people that haven't had access to land. So people that grew up very urban and very poor and they're putting it in trust for that group of people to for them to decide how to manage the land. And I think that's super interesting. I'm not sure that it's like what you're asking, Dory, about like, but I think it's the beginning of people saying going against the rules of capitalism, that I don't have to keep this in my family forever and ever. Um, yeah, I think. And I, it doesn't. We don't have to sweat our equity for all all our land for the major for the most money that we can get out of it. So I think there are signs of something new emerging in that way. Mary left a yeah. book about post capitalism in the chat, and then Emily also talked about new economics. So if any of you want to jump in, um, feel free to do it. Or Dory, I heard your mic went on so can, can i jump in and just say i think that novels are a really wonderful resource and lately with the turn um the recognition amongst a lot of climate activists that we have to start talking about hope as well as um the challenges right so becky chambers has these two novels um a psalm for the wild and a prayer for the crown shy um which are kind of post almost apocalyptic um, novels, but in a hopeful vein. And Victoria Goddard has a whole slew of novels that have, people are reading in churches in the U.S. amongst activism folks um, that have um, a guiding line underneath it of universal basic income. The other thing I was going to say is that there's so much restorative um, and reparative work being done, churches giving land back, like the land back movement is a big thing in parts of the United States. Um, and collective land trusts are one of the things that we're doing in urban settings to fight gentrification. Yeah, there's a fantastic case study of the a land back 
um, movement by the Presbyterians in the Northwest of the U.S. You can easily find that case study online. So. Sorry, did you want to jump in? No, I love, uh, yes, I will. I love the idea of land back and that there's a good case study, just a story. I was with the United Methodist clergy women of New England last month who were negotiating a land back. The church camp is being given back to the indigenous people in that neck of the woods, which I'm just glad to hear stories like that. Uh, I, you know, I'm just going back to your question about late, late capitals. I don't know, again, if this makes sense, but there is a Muslim developer that's doing a lot of development on church land. He did one of the chapters in Gone for Good. Um, Tyler Krupp, but they don't do anything with usury. So they don't do any development with interest and debt financing. So it's all equity backed um, for shared ownership. And he did just do a CLT that was all passive house builds. So Um, the conversation, I, I just want to jump into back into the Mary's comments about nobles being a great start point to imagine <laughs> uh, what would look like after you know, after capitalism and everything. And uh, the book, uh, the J.P. McKinnon's When the World Just Stopped Shopping, that, that, that itself is really a very, you know, radical and, you know, creative and imaginative uh, narrative about the world as we also you know i just remembered you know, as he talked about the case in the uk and some other and uh, some other communities communities around the world he talked about the issues of you know the uh to revitalize or revisit uh the practice of sabbath he suggests that, that we can take the sabbath of spending money for one day at least that's something that we can do we cannot, we cannot, we, the whole world cannot stop shopping, obviously, but at least we can start practicing stop shopping at least for one day in a week. So, so he yeah, also uh, offers some you know, specific numbers, some numbers, I don't remember, specific numbers, what will happen if we really stop shopping or spending any money uh, for at least one day. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we can actually practice individually or communally practice uh, to combat this capitalist ideas. So. This has been a really resource rich chat box. I've been taking these websites and putting them in this eco resource Google doc that anyone can contribute to that's on Padlet. Let me jump in for a moment and notice I just put a link into the Solidarity, Cir Solidarity Circles project at the Wendland Cook Center at Vanderbilt. There are people, um, pastoral leaders primarily, who are really interested in solidarity economics and thinking about how that works uh, mm -hmm. in uh, church space, mostly Christian church spaces. That's a really good um, network of people that have been meeting in cohorts over time. I think now it used to be free. I think now you have to pay something to be involved, but the website is worth following. And there are people scattered across the country who have been doing that work. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any last pressing questions? We have about five more minutes if you want the conversation to keep going, continue. Um, there are some chats that I didn't introduce. Tiffany Trent said, thank you so much. So much of this is about how to tell the story of what is happening and how to frame narrative for interdisciplinary partners. And this is so helpful. And then um, Eileen, she, oh, Eileen, he, she, um, I can't really find you. So anyway, um, talks about St. Mary's University of Minnesota's Geo Capital Service Department is getting involved with churches to help them understand the many opportunities for how to repurpose their land, farming, solar farming, community developing, and they're also helping tribal organizations rethink the use of, of their lands. 
And um, Laura just left a comment saying, big land and farm work in Jewish community with farm and CT to train farmers too um, is also one of the resources that you can look into. I'm just ending this conversation with the um, two loops theory in my mind. And I know that many people have moved on from it, but this feels like a moment of illuminating um, all the systems change work that has already happened and realizing we don't have to invent it. There are all these models out there that are ripe for um, adapting to different contexts, like so much that we've just uh, put a spotlight on. It's making me uh, feel hopeful about the ways that faith communities across the globe are connecting and making, making an impact. So thank you all for shining a, a flashlight on um, what's going on. Thank you. Um, before you leave, please fill out the feedback form for the session at the link provide that Mary just provided. Um, and yeah, thank you to all of you for participating in today's session. It was a wonderful conversation, very enriching, very fruitful. And why don't we give a hand to again to our two speakers and to all of us.